This problem says, find the slope intercept form of the equation of the line through these points, one comma four, three comma 16. It is a good idea when trying to solve a problem like this to try to make a quick sketch of the graph to get a feel for what kind of thing to expect. I think that's a good idea. And the graph doesn't have to be perfect. And maybe, you know, if this were a homework problem, you would not want to bother handing this in. But one four, you could pretend that's that point right there. And 316 is just approximately right here. And you're trying to connect those dots with a straight line and find its equation. It is a little deceiving. It's unclear whether the y-intercept is going to be positive or negative. It depends on how accurate your drawing is. So that's something to be careful of. Actually, I think I'm not being careful enough here. I think it's probably going to be negative. All right, so a more accurate drawing would make it go down there. But you can see that it's upward sloping. The graph goes up as you move from left to right. That's a positive slope. You should expect a positive slope. And it's fairly steep. Slope should be bigger than one. All those kinds of thoughts should be going through your mind as you think about solving this. First thing you should do is find the slope. Often labeled with the letter M, but it doesn't have to be an M. It's just traditional for some reason. You might remember slope is rise over run. And we can go ahead and write those words, rise over run. And you can even add more to your picture to remind yourself what rise and run are. Draw a right triangle in here. Typically, you imagine the independent variable x as increasing, though you can imagine it to decrease. In this case, increasing from one to three, moving to the right. When you imagine a variable changing in the graph, it's nice to imagine it actually moving. But realize it is in your imagination when you do that. So x effectively is going from one to three. It's increasing by two. So the run is two. The rise is a positive number because the graph goes up. If the graph went down, we'd say the rise is a negative number to emphasize that it's going down as you move from left to right. And what's that distance right there? Well, it would be 16 minus four. 16 minus four is 12. The rise is gonna be 12, the run is gonna be two. 12 over two, six is your slope. You should feel comfortable writing other kinds of expressions for the slope. One common kind of expression is to write, say, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, or maybe even y1 minus y0 over x1 minus x0. Which one's the correct one? It doesn't matter. It's the idea that's important. The particular notation used doesn't matter. It is good to try to be consistent with your notation. So there's less confusion. But whether you write the formula like this or like that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you think of this point as having coordinates x0 comma y0 and this one x1 comma y1 or this one x1 comma y1 and this one x2 comma y2. Doesn't matter. The idea is what's important. We also want to get used to capital delta notation. Delta Y over delta X, where the delta is shorthand for change in. That's, yeah, that's not a triangle there. It looks like a triangle, of course, but it's the capital Greek letter delta. Very commonly used in science and engineering to represent change in. Right? You'll see that kind of thing in, in a bunch of science and engineering textbooks and in class. In fact, the professor, Professor Hogan, who was in here the hour before us, had such, an, such symbol on the board already for the physics class. So again, for this problem, that's 12 over 2. That's 6. The slope is 6. But that's not all, right? 
we need the equation, the slope intercept form of the equation of the line. We need the y intercept form, the y intercept as well. We know the equation of a line in slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b using the traditional letters that are used. x for the independent variable, y for the dependent variable, m for the slope, and b for the y intercept. We've already found M, that gets plugged in there. Now find B. Doesn't matter which point we use. It doesn't. It seems like maybe it would matter, doesn't it? Like these are two different points. Couldn't they give you two different values for B? If you do it right, they shouldn't. Let's try using both of them and see if we get the same thing. If I use the point one, four, X, when X is one, Y is four, I substitute, replace Y with four, replace the slope with six, replace X with one, solve for B, subtract six from both sides now to isolate the B, you get B is negative two. You can put those together over, over here if you like. B equals negative two. By the way, arrows, which I usually make kind of like with double lines there, indicate the step on the right follows from the step on the left. The thing on the left implies the thing on the right. Don't write equal signs there. That's sloppy. Equality should be when things are really equal. This is called an implication. If I've got that point, it implies that the equation of the line satisfies this equation. And that ultimately helps me solve for B. B is negative two. If I use the other point, 316, I should get the same final answer. 316 being on the line means that when I replace Y with 16 and X with three, I should be able to solve for B. Now subtract 18 from both sides to isolate the B. And once again, you get B is negative two. If you do it right, you should get the same answer either way. Do you have to do it both ways? No. One way is good enough. You may also have solved this in another way using what's called point slope form. Y minus, should I call it Y zero or Y one? It doesn't matter. We have different opinions. I like using zero to tell you the truth. If you prefer using a one, it's fine. Doesn't matter, it's the idea that's important. That's a specific Y coordinate of a specific point. That's all that matters. Equals the slope times X minus, okay, be consistent. If I use a zero there, I should use a zero there. M is the slope. X zero comma Y zero are the coordinates of a specific point. And again, it doesn't matter which point you use. So plug in, say the first point with coordinates again, one comma four. When X is one, Y is four, I can replace the Y zero with four, slope with six, X zero with one. It's maybe a little confusing the fact that Back up here, there were no subscripts. There was no Y zero and X zero, and I replaced the Y with four and the X with one. But now there are subscripts. I replaced the Y zero with four and the X zero with one, not the Y and the X themselves. Maybe that's a little confusing. Up here, the X and Y do not have subscripts because it's traditional not to bother when they are the true variables that are changing in your imagination. Any specific point I plug in for those coordinates should still make the equation true and allow me to solve for B. When I look at this form, I'm thinking of the plane X and the plane Y as still being variables. But I'm thinking about plugging in a specific point, specific numbers for X0 and Y0. Again, I know that's confusing for many people. It's just something to kind of get used to. You do want your equation in the end to involve variables. And I mean, it did back up here. I never, I never wrote the answer, but 
in either case, I could write the final answer as y equals 6x minus 2. I, I never did that before. I should have. Write your final answer and circle it or put it in a box. Here, that's point-slope form. To solve for slope-intercept form, I should solve for y. I can also expand with the distributive property right there. To solve for y, I need to get rid of that minus 4 on the left, so I add it to both sides, cancel it. y equals, once again, 6x minus 2. Negative 6 plus 4 would be minus 2. Same answer as before. The slope-intercept form, we typically think of as being the nicest form, in large part because it's what you might call the function form. I could think of this as being a function, f of x. When I don't have y solved for, when the equation is like this, for example, this thing is not f of x yet. I have to add 4 to both sides to get the function f of x whose graph is the straight line. Does that make sense? Can I clarify anything? Where does this form come from? It comes from the definition of slope. If you, if you divide both sides by x minus x zero, you effectively get this equation right there with different symbols. But the idea is the same. You're still doing rise over run x0, y0 are specific coordinates of a specific specific point on the line. It doesn't matter which point. x and y are variables. They Those could represent the coordinates of any point, an arbitrary point in the line. Slope-intercept form is also nice because you see right there what the slope is. It's 6. You see what the y-intercept. It's negative 2. The y-intercept is where the graph crosses the y-axis. It's the value of y when x is 0. Replace x with 0, and you get negative 2. Back in this graph, we're crossing the y-axis at negative 2. It's also very important in calculus to realize the slope is what's called a rate of change. m, the slope, is also the rate of change well, you shouldn't just stop there and just say rate of change. You should say of y with respect to x. WRT means with respect to. It's telling you how fast y changes as x changes. And if it's bigger than 1, like 6 is, that means y changes faster than x does. It's good to try to imagine what that means in your mind, play an, uh, an animation in your mind. As x increases and moves to the right along the x-axis, what happens to the corresponding y value in this graph, which is the second coordinate of the point? It would be increasing six times faster than x does. If these are literal distances on a piece of paper, like they are, as I've drawn them, if and if the units of measurement here of distance were, say, centimeters, if x moves to the right by one centimeter per second, the corresponding y value would move upward by six centimeters per second. Six times faster. That is important an essential thing to understand in calculus, especially with regard to applications. And the y-intercept, the b, is sometimes called the initial value as well, because it's the value of y when x is zero. Sometimes you think of zero as the starting point, maybe a starting time. And so maybe you use a t instead of an x as well, but it doesn't have to be time, and we still could call it an initial value. 
negative two in this case is the value of y when x is zero. Could x be negative for the application? Sure, it could be. Like for temperature scales as a common example, Fahrenheit and Celsius at least can be negative. Kelvin can't be, but Fahrenheit and Celsius based on how they're constructed can be as we experience in Minnesota quite often, right? In the winter, if you're not from Minnesota, negative temperatures in the Fahrenheit scale each, even. You know, Fahrenheit negatives are even colder than Celsius negatives. And actually it's a little funny until you get to negative 40, then they're the same. And then it's reversed after that. But uh, yeah, we don't really, we rarely get to negative 40, okay? Negative 32 is the coldest I remember, but uh, suppose we still could break a record. Is this the only way to write the point slope form? No, it's actually not. It's the most clear relationship between the point slope form and the formula for the slope as rise over run. However, I will tell you that I often don't bother with the minus y zero on the left right away, but put it, add it right away to both sides and have it as a plus on the right. This equation is equivalent to y equaling y zero plus m times x minus x zero. Those two equations mean the exact same thing. And I just go ahead and jump to that one right away, to tell you the truth. This is also nice in looking at, in seeing that when x equals x zero, which is not necessarily zero, x zero is not necessarily zero, then y will be y zero plus zero, y will be y zero. Now, I know I'm talking with lots of letters here and no numbers. It is essential, if you're going to be a science or engineering major, that you start to work at getting used to being able to think about equations like this that have a bunch of letters within them, but no numbers. That's an essential skill in becoming a scientist or engineer. Or math major as well, of course. Even if you're not a math, science, or engineering major, it's still good to be able to think about this to improve your thinking skills, your problem solving skills, your modeling skills. And ultimately, long term, you may say, being a good citizen for understanding how science works. And maybe teaching your kids in the future too. Okay. Whether you homeschool or not, still good to teach your kids. Not that you'll be teaching your seven-year-old kid about variables unless they just really want to know, okay? It is good to know about generalities too. Positive slope means, again, the graph rises as you move from left to right. That's where the slope M is positive. Negative slope means the graph goes down, falls, you might say, as you move from left to right. Zero slope means the graph is horizontal. That's supposed to be a zero slope. I didn't really draw it so well. It's supposed to be a horizontal line there. I'll, I'll, I'll change. I can fix that, right? I can change my paper. There we go. What about a vertical line? Undefined slope, M is undefined. Now, some people might, might write M equals infinity. Are they right if they say M equals infinity? Well, it depends on what you mean by right. It depends on what you mean by infinity. Yeah, you might say it's minus infinity. Uh, in this class, we do not treat infinity as a number. There are actually some math classes where infinity is treated as a number, but those are usually really, really advanced. It's called an infinite ordinal or cardinal number. And then you might wonder what's the difference between an ordinal number and a cardinal number. Well, ordinal numbers are for ordering things. Cardinal numbers are for keeping track of amount. 
in a nutshell. And there are infinite numbers that represent infinity in real advanced math classes. And in fact, there's infinitely many infinities. What? I'm serious. There's infinitely many infinities. How can that be? Yeah, we're not going to get into it, but you can think about it if you want. So it's good to know about generalities. It's all and I and it's also good, for example, in this case, to realize that the steeper the line gets, the bigger M is. If the if the graph is really, really steep, but not quite vertical, maybe you can't, can't tell the difference. M could be very, very large. It could be a thousand, it could be a million, it could be a billion. It can get arbitrarily large as the line gets closer and closer to being vertical. It can also be arbitrarily large negatively. I got to think about your perspective here is the, if the line has a negative slope, gets that gets more and more steep, like negative a million. Does that come up in applications? Well, probably rarely, unless you use weird measurement units. It'd be rare to have a slope of a million in an application. I mean, if you're you, if you're measuring your, the speed of your car in in micrometers per hour, then it might be in the millions or billions or whatever. But that would be a, a weird measurement unit to use. Okay. Domain and range. What are domain and range? Domain is the set of all possible inputs. <clears throat> that's, that's the word set there if you can't quite tell set set of all possible inputs and the range is the corresponding set of all possible outputs in the absence of an application you should assume the domain is as big as possible. And for a linear function, y equals f of x equals mx plus b, the domain would be all real numbers. Sometimes specified with a fancy looking r for the real number system. That's a traditional way to write it. Sometimes specified with what's called interval notation minus infinity to infinity. Sometimes specified with what's called set builder notation, without, which our book doesn't really use, but I want you to know it. I'm using curly braces here, or curvy braces if you prefer. The set of all x such that, that vertical line means such that, well, what should I write here? Uh, just I'll just say x is a real number. I'll just go ahead and use words. Sometimes you write inequalities over here to specify x in, in some interval, like between zero and one, for example. Zero would be less than x, would be less than one in that case. That's the natural domain to use here. And what you, it's what you should use for this example, unless there's an application that restricts the domain, which can happen. And it turns out that the range is also all real numbers, as long as the slope is not zero. If M is not equal to zero. If the slope is zero, if the graph's a horizontal line, the range has only got one number in it, whatever the Y coordinate of that horizontal line is. You can have ranges with just one number if it's a constant function. Running low on time, you're going to see in your reading, which you should do, other kinds of functions. For example, oh, say something like this. F of x equals, say, square root of x over x. Oh, what should I use? How about minus 4? What's the domain of this? It would be all numbers that you're allowed to plug in. What do you want to watch out for? You don't want to divide by zero. And for our class, you don't want to take the square root of a negative number. That's called an imaginary number when you do. 
That is something that is useful, actually. Imaginary numbers are useful. I'm serious. They are. They're used in differential equations, for example, all the time. They're used in electronics, a physics class, all the time. Okay, they are turn out to be useful, but for us, we're not dealing with imaginary numbers. So we want the input there to be greater than or equal to zero. And we also don't want to divide by zero. We'd want X to not equal four. So the domain of this in interval notation would be the interval from zero to four, including zero, but not four. That's what the square bracket here means and the parenthesis here means unioned combined with the interval from four to infinity. And because infinity is not a number, we don't put a square bracket there. With set builder notation, that would be all, the set of all real numbers X that satisfy one or the other of these inequalities. And it's implicit here that X is a real number question. The square root of zero is zero. You can take the square root of zero. I'm avoiding negative numbers. I'd be dividing by zero minus four. So I'm not dividing by zero either. If I plugged in zero here, I would get the square root of zero over zero minus four is zero over negative four is zero. So that's that's okay. To do. It's, it's okay if, if you have a zero on the top, as long as it's not on the bottom, then the answer is zero. Zero over zero does occur in calculus as what's called a, an indeterminate form. It's what's called a limit problem. That will be coming up soon, but not today. All right. Have a good day.